Uh, this lecture is part of the St. Elmo Arts Residency, which is a joint project of the Department of Art and Art History and the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. The residency offers one fellowship each academic year to an artist who recently received their MFA. The residency provides a beautiful house and studio in the St. Elmo District of South Austin. The fellow is given the opportunity to work with the Wildflower Center, teach courses in the Department of Art and Art History, and the fellow mounts a solo exhibition through the Wildflower Center. I wanted to say uh, thank you to Jill and Stephen Wilkinson, who generously makes the St. Elmo residency possible. Um, last year's St. Elmo Fellow was Meredith Hillbrand. Uh, Meredith is a multidisciplinary artist who just moved back to Los Angeles. Her practice includes sculpture, installation, video, writing, and photography. Her work has been included in group shows across the United States, such as the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the Culver Center in Riverside, California, Riverside Art Museum, Steve Turner Gallery in Los Angeles, and Southern Exposure in San Francisco. She received her MFA in 2019 from the University of California, Riverside. Her solo exhibition titled Some Fields the Track Goes Through is currently up at the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center until the end of September. Please join me in welcoming, well, welcoming back Meredith Hilbrand. Hello. Um, oops. Hi, everyone. Uh, how do we get the, is the presentation up? Is it on me? Yes, it's up. Oh, okay. It's showing like on my screen, my face. Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> my name is Meredith. Um, Thank you all for coming. I actually am going to turn off my video because we're having some Wi-Fi issues and I just don't want it to like freeze out. Um, so unfortunately I'll just be a, a talking voice to all of you with these images, but um, I'll come back for the questions. Um, so yeah, I am um, sad we didn't get to do this last year, but I'm happy to um, be here today. Uh, from Los Angeles. So uh, I work in sculpture, installation, writing, and video, a lot of different mediums. Um, but I'm gonna kind of focus today on these, the last two exhibitions I did, um, which are really focused on sculptural installation. Um, but this kind of, like my background of having all these different medias I work in is still really informs my sculpture practice. Um, and is kind of important to how I make sculptures today. Um, I've kind of the past few years I've really been focusing on expanding this relationship between language and sculpture. I kind of came to visual art as a writer, and because of that, I really think about things in relation to text and language, um, and that relationship to material and form and kind of how we ascribe meaning to material and form. Um, so this picture we're looking at now is kind of like a tableau of an exhibition I did called Pipe Mountain Extremity Plan. And it was kind of an installation of a lot of different types of sculptural screens and tables and fountains, um, kind of using these familiar, somewhat familiar forms of furniture or construction um, to kind of think about the relation of a body to space and to kind of our built environment. Um, and then kind of thinking about this like language to sculpture um, relationship. Um, I feel like this show is like kind of like language formation, like a lot of it is kind of these abstract ambiguous forms. Um, but We'll kind of get into some of it. And a lot of this, uh, this body of work I made was really heavily influenced from this research trip I took to Vienna and Prague, kind of studying early modernist architecture. Um, so a lot of the photographs as we go are, are from those spaces, and I'll kind of talk about that. Um, so this first piece is called Spaghetti Wall Kukaloris. Um, and it was uh, 
so this like black um, squiggly shape you see is uh, a image of spaghetti that I enlarged uh, and CNC'd um, to be human scale. So this is like one of the screens. Um, and I was kind of thinking about, you know, these like vector images of like, if you're familiar with graphics or illustrator, like how text gets enlarged is usually it's a vector image. So it's like an image that can be scaled to any size without losing resolution. So I was interested in like taking that and making something really physical out of wood with it, this kind of like digital to physical space. Um, and kind of using this shape of spaghetti to kind of like in some way represent the body or like, um, you know, this kind of organic form. And it's sandwiched between these like two kind of construction panels, one wood and one um, metal. And here's some detail shots of that. So it was also this kind of ebonized process on the wood, um, which is a way of like transforming the tannin or like the acid of the wood to get the black color. You like kind of rub this like steely mixture on and it just instantly turns black. So um, in a lot of these works, it's kind of like thinking about these different ways of transforming objects or transforming the materials um, where the the color is like part of the surface um, itself, not applied just to it. So the, another part of this piece was it had a spotlight on it that was reflecting through it, um, which is like the title, Spaghetti Wall Cucaloris. A Cucaloris is like a, or they call it a cookie. It's like in film production. It's what they use to kind of mimic like a forest, the light coming through the trees on the forest, they like make these black uh, cut out panels of abstract shapes and that's kind of what creates the, the lighting effect. Um, so a lot of this work too kind of came from, before I went to grad school, I worked in a lot of different production, commercial and in fine art and, um, you know, I was kind of interested in all these like kind of adaptive ways materials were used um, in thinking about that. Uh, and kukaloris is like, I think a funny word that they use because it's a play on this Greek word for light. It's just kind of this like silly way of describing a really, you know, like cut and paste kind of technique of just like cutting cardboard <laughs> and shining a light through it. Um, so with a lot of these works, it was this, or with like the whole, um, kind of exhibition, you would like walk through and meander through these kind of sculptures and come across this environment. And, um, you know, my hope is like the, the viewer kind of performing or like enacting with these objects. So there's this kind of the spotlight, kind of that like performativity. Um, this is one of the table works, one of the two or three table works that were in it. Um, and so in a lot of these, it's like each work in the show really had like a totally different way of thinking about it and materials and processes that was made with. Um, and with all of those, it was kind of thinking about making these like visual cues and sculpture that kind of make you unravel or think about how they're made or kind of like think about these different connections that are being made. And so there's a lot of focus on like how things are connected, how things are touching, what's supporting what, um, you know, in this work, it's like this photo frame is on the floor where usually like a photo is on a wall, you know, it's not functional. It's like just an image. And here it's actually kind of supporting these two tables that are intertwined. Um, and the table is actually like cut into the frame. So it's going all the way through to the floor and kind of holding it. This was uh, another work. Um, I'm sorry, just like, okay. Um, this is another work of uh, these windows. So these were two images taken um, from these Adolf Loos buildings I was looking at in Vienna. Um, 
and this just like this really basic way of painting these radiators whether they were hot or cold um i was really interested in and so i took these photos and then kind of made these photo sculptures so the images are like embedded in these kind of window picture frames that are hanging um so this is just another image from when i was working in production and fabrication in LA and kind of what a lot of that um, kind of inspired me of just being into these different manufacturing spaces kind of used for all sorts of stuff that gets made on a large scale. So this is an image from a veneer factory in LA. Just um, I put a few like kind of reference things like this in here because I just always like seeing what people are looking at when they're making work and um, this is an image that just like stuck with me and I go back to a lot. Uh, so this is a veneer factory in Los Angeles and veneer is like where they take these pieces of wood and just like slowly strip the wood really thin, um, you know, and like we'll attach it to like plywood so you can have like a, a nice finish on like a cheaper piece of wood. But this kind of process of manufacturing where it's like a really intense taking something apart to put it back together um that kind of like process is something I thought about a lot in making these different works um like you know this is like a redwood tree that's been cut and then stripped and then like re um assembled back into the tree with all of these slits and that kind of like dissection um is something I really think about in sculpture uh so here's another view you can kind of see better all of the works that were in the show. Um, so there were these three fountains in the show as well, and you couldn't really see them. Uh, you know, this is kind of where you would walk into the space and you couldn't really see them when you walk in, but you just hear them. So this kind of creating an environment or um, for me, the fountains kind of represent the body in this space. Like there's something that's moving and creating sound and kind of this like calming, um, you know, slightly familiar experience, and you would kind of stumble upon them as you walked through. This is one of the other table pieces. This one was called um, Potential Table. And in this work, it was, I molded this phone um, in a similar way that like early fiberglass chairs were made. Um, just I made like my own press to do it. And, you know, with a lot of these things, it was like thinking about these kind of handmade ways of mimicking more manufacturing processes or just like, it was really important for me to like make the shapes out of material that shouldn't hold the shape. Um, and then kind of framing it with these structural uh, aluminum pieces. And um, and in like some of these like furniture forms, I'm also thinking about um, they kind of become these like speculative fictions of furniture. Um, just like thinking of like different ways tables could be made that like aren't actually useful to put something on. So kind of playing with this functionality and aesthetics um, between these relationships of you know, furniture and, and sculpture. And here's another view of that. And kind of this like cross section of things. Um, you know, I always, the thing I really love about sculpture and is, you know, going around something in the round and having all these different views, um, you know, being able to create something where you don't, you know, kind of this full image, but then as soon as you turn a corner, it like kind of disintegrates. Um, I really think about that in relation to like moving images. So like creating these experiences for a viewer to walk around something and have all these different um, images kind of created through this one object. Uh, this piece was surrogate table. So it's kind of, it's the same framing of the center there. Um, and then uh, 
just like replicated into this kind of like almost like a chromosome, large chromosome table. Um, but there's like a lot of doubling or like sistering I was thinking about in these works, um, this kind of repetition of the form, uh, kind of furthering thinking about this like montage in space or like relationship between moving images and in an installation. Um, you know, we kind of like expand our understanding of things as we can like move around and kind of contemplate them and that kind of action of thinking. I really think about in terms of um, a sculptural space. So here's one of the fountains on the left. You can see kind of this hidden by this pillar. So here's one fountain. And I had all the fountains kind of on these like doormats or um, you know, this one was on these like floor frames, kind of like elevating them off. Um, the gallery floor a little bit. Um, and this one was behind that kind of spaghetti wall and I also had this like rust, so the, the black of the spaghetti wall made by rust and then behind it was this kind of, um, the rust of the steel was patinaing the ceramic piece in the middle. It had this like pretty beautiful like orange water. Um, so then there were also these Spatial devices. Uh, this one's called Spatial Device Impossible Core. Um, and they were all hinged. And so the centerpiece kind of rotates. Um, and so I would, whenever I came to the gallery, I'd kind of rotate it and put it in a different position. Um, kind of thinking about this like collapsibility and like foldable, movable works, just like kind of going into this sculpture as a movement and not as just a static object. Here's a detail of that. And this was another spatial device that was on the floor and had this kind of um, spun wood piece kind of propping it up. This piece was also part of this exhibition, but it was like in another space than that entryway. Um, and I made this before I made all the other works. And I feel like it was kind of the, the beginning to kind of thinking about dissecting these spaces or kind of thinking about um, domestic interiors as, as a space to kind of pull um, this relationship between sculpture and design. Um, so this was called cropped room, cropped living room with cups. Um, and it's kind of made to look as if it's like cut out of a full room and picked up and moved. Um, just kind of thinking about, you know, these ways that images or objects kind of become an image, you know, in photography to like crop the frame. It doesn't really make you think about what's not in the frame as much. I mean, sometimes it can, but um, you know, with sculpture, it's like a physical thing. Um, it immediately kind of you see that effect of something of the the newspaper being cut, and immediately kind of imagine the rest of the newspaper. Um, so these works. We're in the show, um, but this is just an image of them photographed elsewhere for something else. Uh, but there is, like, I make a lot of posters as well, and this um, was a work where they kind of became a sculptural element. So the left is from one view, and then the right is if you walked around it, there was kind of the, the back of the, the frames is this cardboard. Um, and there's a huge siren going on outside. Um, with this, uh, I don't know if you guys can hear that, but it's, I think a little past it. Okay. Um, so this piece was like one of the first times I started incorporating actual text into the sculptures, um, which the next show I talk about is kind of all that is. Um, and this was kind of playing with this kind of disconnect between the text and the image or like trying to find these ways of 
codifying or making sense of this. Um, so, you know, one says either, you know, says or, um, you know, kind of thinking about this language formation. So like kind of in the other sculptural work, you know, trying to create the syntax with all of these different types of complicated processes, like in one space. Um, here I was kind of like distilling it down into like being one work. And so there are these frames that I made for the posters and then they're kind of propped up on these like really oversized and kind of ridiculous um, frame structures. They're like a little taller than you if you stand next to them. And like in these poster series, um, like one of the things I was thinking about a lot, actually in the whole show is like Georges Tati, who I really love, this French comedian and filmmaker. This is from a movie of his called Playtime. And it's like this woman, um, they're like in this gray world, everything, you know, it's kind of this making fun of like early modernism, like everything this looks the same, it's all gray. And this was like a um, uh, a tourist office she walks into uh, to choose where she wants to go. And it's all the same building, you know, but it's like these colorful names, but it's in different places. Um, so like a, in a lot of the work that I was just showing, it's like this dissection of the everyday or kind of this repetition of stuff, um, you know, it's kind of playing into these questions of, you know, when we start to make the world all the same, you know, what, where's the difference? And, and that's kind of um, that relationship I see with, with language and how we talk about things and how we live in spaces, um, you know, and, and how we, what we live around, you know, how that influences us. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna spend the rest of the time talking about the show that's up in Austin. And if you're, if you're there, um, you can still have a week to go see it. Uh, so this is at the Lady Bird Johnson Wildfire Center, and um, the show's called Some Fields the Track Goes Through, um, and the show, I'm going to just like talk about all aspects of the show, because I started making this work in March, and then the pandemic hit, and then I finished the work, um, and then it was up for the whole summer. Um, so there was a lot of different things that changed because of how the world was changing, um, but I found that to just kind of be an interesting way to work work with it and just kind of see where things went. So originally the show was going to be the lamps in the um, in this old carriage house and then the bent there were benches that were going to be throughout the garden. So the title was kind of a way to kind of uh, bridge these two things is if there was like an imaginary track that was going to be connecting these lamps to the to the benches um, but in the end you know they all ended up in the same room but um, uh, oh so the series of lamps um, for this show were all made using the sign engraver at the Wildflower Center, um, which is kind of what the center uses to make little plaques for all the different plants um, that uh, plants and signage, um, different kinds of things. So I was kind of thinking about, you know, the space of the garden and kind of my interest in architecture and usually working on a site specifically and kind of finding where those those spaces overlap. Um, you know, the the signs I kind of read is like the system of communication and, you know, in all of these sculptural works I make, I'm like really contemplating and thinking about like how materials are communicating, how histories of form are communicating. Um, and so for this show, I really wanted to kind of distill that and just use text, um, text on form, on lamp forms to kind of talk about these these things. Um, and so the the text on all of the lamps kind of came from research and writings that, um, that I was doing at my time in Austin um, and kind of thinking about them as directions um, that would like lead you through the room. So if you're in the space, you can kind of follow them through um, the back corridor. So like from this 
window kind of going to the back wall. Um, and then the benches are all based on tete-a-tete -tete chairs, um, which I'll get into a little bit later. And they were going to be like tete-a-tete -tete chairs are uh, like a French Victorian way of kind of keeping seating two people face to face. Tete-a-tete -tete means head to head in French. Um, and so I was making these benches that people would sit together and, um, you know, and spark conversation, but then they would also be looking into opposite directions. So this is one of the lamps. Um, and I was also looking at a lot of concrete poetry at the time. Um, in, in dealing with these texts, like the, the way the sign engraver prints text is really limited. So I was trying to play with how to kind of make all these different ways of using, using the text to be readable or illegible. So this has like two kind of poems about press. So right now you can see like half of it. And if you walk around, you can read the full thing. Um, so this is the first lamp I made. And so this is actually made from some of the signs um, in the, some of the discard signs at the Wildflower Center, um, which I kept in the show as kind of this like index to, um, you know, if you go in, you don't read anything about the show, you can kind of maybe start to understand the like relationship the, the panels are having to the space. And a lot of the lamps, I kind of thought about them as their own, as like each of them is like a building or like an architecture in itself. And they all kind of are representing these different ideas I was thinking about at the time. Um, and a lot of them had these kind of like punctuation marks this one said pause really large across the front. Um, you know, so I was like printing the text in one direction and then like kind of moving the panel and printing in the opposite direction to kind of layer the text and have these different ways of reading it and kind of like forcing you to kind of move your body in different ways to, to walk around the lamps and read them. Uh, and this was pavilion lamp, so it has a little text about pavilions or um, a type of um, outdoor architecture. Typically, they kind of combine the inside and outside. They're not usually completely sealed. So this um, lamp is also a bit open. Um, and pavilion comes from the Latin word for butterfly. So I was also trying to find architecture, words about architecture and the body that also related to botany, kind of this way that language doubles itself. And um, you know, we use the same words to kind of describe really dis different systems as kind of like mimicking that's happening. And here's another example of that way that language operates. Um, it says root relation system, and then on the other side, it says body supporting structure. Um, you know, ways that we think about the body as a root, or the roots, you know, as the base of a tree body. Um, and then it's kind of in this like tubular form again, which repeats a lot uh, in my work. Here's another one of the benches. This is a um, engraved into cedar, uh, which is native to Texas. Um, and good for outdoors, because this was originally going to be outdoors, so it's weatherproof. Um, and then there's like a punctuation lamp above it, and then there's another lamp in the back. And um, it was important to me that the windows remained open, that they weren't covered. Um, kind of letting in and like projecting these lamps into the garden, the garden kind of coming into the, the carriage house. So um, kind of wanting to work in the outdoor space in the end, it kind of worked out in this, this gallery, um, kind of combining that. Uh, so here's another one of the tete-a-tete -tete benches that was going to be outside. So this didn't end up being in the show, but I wanted to just include it to kind of talk about these this form a bit. Um, so I kind of chose the tete-a-tete -tete form. Uh, you know, it's 
they were never made out of this kind of bent steel. It was like a very Victorian, um, like here's an example of a very classic tete-a-tete -tete chair. They're usually very decorative and plush. Um, and it was kind of like a French aristocratic um, seat that would like be in the center of the room. And it's like a conversation chair, like kissing chair. It was like, a way of gossiping really um so two people could sit side by side and kind of whisper in each other's ear um without being noticed but i really liked this idea of just a seat that like kind of forced people to be together and to kind of sit it just like i mean it's like the world's changed so much since march or like january when i first started thinking about this but like um you know in some ways it's thinking about like re revisiting these kind of cultural forms and revising them a bit and kind of thinking about, um, you know, politics in the country and this kind of inability to talk, but also this desire to talk or like, you know, you're kind of sitting in this chair, you're facing your own direction, even though you're, you're hearing maybe a different perspective. Um, and that was definitely something I was thinking about kind of in this shape. Um, and, and it also creates this S, so it kind of, you know, relates back to this, this text focus. Um, and this is, I did like a workshop over the weekend at the Wildflower Center, kind of around more of the research I had done for this show, but I just wanted to include this here um, because a lot of the show kind of came from really trying to combine these different um, elements. So on the left is an image from Carl Blasfeld, who was a artist in like the early 1900s, but he made all of these macro photography uh, images of botanical plants kind of to help aid students in learning how to draw um, botanical illustration. But a lot of people relate these images to things like on the right, the chair by Eileen Gray, um, who did a lot of early bent steel furniture I was looking at when I was designing the tete-a-tete -tete chairs and a lot of people relate the way he kind of enlarged the plant world um, to early modern buildings so this kind of like iconic column of the plant stem becomes the bent steel becomes a skyscraper um, and I found this like so fascinating and just such a good way of kind of connecting the things I was already thinking about spending time at the wildflower center to this um, period in industrial design I'm really fascinated by. Um, and the bent steel chair was kind of the first really reproducible furniture. Um, so this was a chair, version of the chair that ended up in the show, but this one's actually kind of impossible to sit in. So in the end, kind of this gap between when I started making the work and when the work was finished, um, you know, being able to sit next to a stranger became impossible. So I kind of just ended up approaching that in the show um, and kind of making this impossible chair to sit in. This is a view like going, if you're at the garden, this is kind of how you approach it. And just again, kind of like this enmeshing of the, the inside and outside. Um, and here's some more of the lamp, close up of the lamp. Another punctuation lamp. Oh wait, sorry, I wanted to talk about this one. So this this one has like the most um uh layered text in it and you know it's kind of like thinking about pacing with the text so like some are very simple to read and some are kind of more um explicit and this one says undoing unbuilding undoing and then on the other side it says restructuring redistributing restructuring redistributing um and again it's like making this stuff in march and like a lot of the text on this came from a book about um, fantasy architecture it was made by these pop artists in the, the 60s and there's a lot of like literary games of um, kind of 
thinking about like what if we could build in the way that we like collage text or cut and paste images. So I kind of adapted some of that text. And um, so one side's kind of all about, you know, these questions of like inverting physical space. And then the restructuring, redistrib redistributing was more about um, this text about uh, kind of relating the body, uh, thinking about systems of flow and relating um, construction more to the body. There's another punctuation lamp. Uh, this one says we are furnishing and the other side says we are furnished. And this one says growing distortion, which I'm kind of reading these because actually when you see the show, you can't go inside. Um, because of COVID regulation. We were hoping to open the show for people to walk around inside, but um, unfortunately you can't. So a lot of this text, you can see from that like picture plane window that I showed at the beginning, but a lot of the text you just cannot read from it. So I'm just, um, you know, this is kind of the walkthrough of the show no one will get to get. Uh, this one has three sides and it kind of cycles through the, these three words, the spirit, object, metal, and then there's metal, object, spirit, and then object, spirit, metal. I think the order. Um, so again, like some of these just were takes on different words and kind of thinking about these poetic devices of concrete poetry, um, repeating in circles and in things that how you read something, you know, in your mind versus how you say it out loud, the this, this separation between reading and speaking. Um, so some of these lamps, I think, are better read aloud, um, or, you know, it's just a different experience of doing that. Here's another side of that. And I forget what the other side of this says. So this is upwards, not downwards, downwards, not rearwards. I think the, the other side was the opposite. So it was onwards, not upwards, and then rearwards, not downwards. So this kind of repetitive cycle. Um, and I think, yeah, that's it of these images. So um, I'll turn my video back on and we could move to like doing a little question, question and answer thing. There we go. Yeah, so, so if anybody has questions, uh, please just feel free to unmute and ask. Don't be shy. <laughs> I have just like a, um, are, just like a technical question. Are the yeah, they're like colored light bulbs in all of these lights, or is it just like the ref mm. reflection of the metal? Um, that's a great question and something I totally just started over without talking about, but I did want to bring up. Um, yeah, they are all, there's several different lights, and I kind of just arranged them um, in relation to the color of the, the panels um, and kind of how they were kind of making these different color landscapes inside. So, um, you know, in, yeah, I guess I didn't really approach that at all in this talk yet, but like why I chose lamps as something um, to deal with, you know, kind of relating to this interest in the history of furniture and domestic space um, and sculpture, you know, I wanted to make something that actually would exist in people's homes. So, um, you know, this is an installation, but ideally I would, I want these works to exist in interior spaces and things that people live around. Um, and that's kind of why they have all these messagings too, is to think about, I was thinking about text that would exist. Um, you know, something you would see every day and kind of what, what does that do to kind of see these poems in that space. But the, the color of the light bulb, um, 
was also just thinking about how how you know in the la the first show I was my thesis show I was showing how color becomes transformative um, in a material and kind of thinking about light as this material the colored lights as a material cultural material as well um, so yeah unfortunately again if you go in person <laughs> if you get to go inside it's a really different experience with the colors in the window. Thank you. Hi, Meredith. Um, I'm Mindy. I work for Fine Arts Hi. Library. Uh, we're a, um, a branch of the of Perry Castaneda Library. Uh, so your work oh, is great. really lovely. Um, remind me how long these pieces for this um, for this show took you to bring together? And um, how, did any of them change along the way as you worked with them? Yeah, yeah, so like entirely. I mean, the lamps kind of stayed as they were. The benches really changed because they were gonna be outside. Um, but yeah, I started making these in December, January. Um, and then they were finished in April. Um, but there was like kind of this gap between April and then it was installed in June. So it's just, uh, so yeah, it was just because of COVID, there was all this delay. So it was like making the lamps and then UT shut down and I had to take like a few weeks off and then they're like, no, you can come back. And then I would run back to the sculpture lab and like work for a week and be like, no, you can't come anymore. So um there was like these kind of funny gaps in, in making them and, and rethinking them but the yes i printed all the text at the wildflower center and then i bent all of the lamps at, at ut um in the sculpture area so it's kind of a fun way to like use those spaces as a studio Thank Hi, you. this is andre uh with landmarks Hi. Hi. Yeah, hello. First of all, just thank you for giving this um, great overview of your work and this beautiful show. It's especially meaningful for those of us who can't get to Austin um, to be able to at yes. least have a little bit of it. <laughs> so I really appreciate that. I, I was just thinking about how, um, well, first of all, I know you have a lot of experience teaching. And I know that um, a, a part of this residency has been the teaching assignments both at the university as well as at the Wildflower Center. And I was just wondering, um, like, have there been connection points or um, ways in which you have interacted with students or learned specifically about this place of being in Texas that has uh, caused you to maybe reimagine, reconsider, or expand some of your thinking relative to your practice? Oh, yes. I mean, definitely. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, to first, like the Wildflower Center um, really changed things. Like I had done my thesis show and, you know, was thinking a lot about mimetic structures and a lot of the kind of mimetic theory comes from the world of botany. And so I was really excited to kind of spend more time, you know, with all of these plants and really think about that. Um, and a lot of the things I did at the Wildflower Center was just kind of like tagging along with people. Like I did a lot of gardening, um, you know, spent time learning how to use the sign engraver, which kind of opened me up to this whole world of volunteers and people that were just like in and out of the center. Um, and so that was just kind of like this wealth of knowledge to come across. Um, and also just thinking about the space, you know, it's like, for those of, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you know about the Wildflower Center, but like a space where all of these native plants live together. So it's kind of this like imaginary real world sanctuary of plants, you know, where like there isn't a place in Texas, all of these things exist except there. Um, yet they all could. So this kind of like imaginary possibility that's like this realm I really think about with, you know, in my work. Um, and and just like 
being able to kind of take these leaps and, and, and work in this different way, like making an art show for a garden is now something I actually am like talking about with some of the people at the Wildflower Center, like helping me build relationships with other gardens um, that they know of. So that's, that's really exciting. Um, yeah, and then working with students, I mean, I was lucky to like teach mainly in sculpture at UT. And so um, that was just kind of this incredible way of, of understanding um, what like young artists in, in Texas are like really thinking of with, with these processes. Um, yeah, there's so many things that, I mean, it's like UT itself is like such an amazing research center that like, I just feel like I got exposed to so, so much that like I'm gonna unpack for years now. So <laughs> it, was, it was amazing. <laughs> I just will follow up by saying thank you for your answer and um, and for making such lovely work too and for being here. Oh, thank week. you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I already miss it. <laughs> well, Meredith, this is Jill Wilkinson. Oh, hi, Jill. And hi. I got to see the show in person. I luckily. know. I was one of the few people that yeah. saw it before you, right before you left for California. Um, yeah, and, and um, Andre sort of um, prompted a, a, a question I was trying to, I don't know if I have the right question, but I wanted to ask you about how these works, if you were to put them in nature, um, how, what, how would you go about that? Or, or do, you, do you think they would be hidden or would they be, I mean, what would you do if that were the next um, if, if you even had to take all these that are in this room and you were, and somebody said, you have to take them outside and put them out there, what would you do? Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question. Cause the, the benches were going to be outside and I actually had gone on, you know, I had lots of conversations with like the horticultural team at the Wildflower Center and we found like a dozen locations that they could have existed in. Um, and we were like finding spaces that were in transition. So like they were already going to kind of take all the plants out of that area and kind of build something else. So it was like a perfect spot. Like you know, we just found all these places that had good views from two directions, um, but they were all kind of just off the path. So they weren't, uh, well, yeah, they were, they were hidden and they were in spaces that people don't normally stop and spend time uh -huh. in. So that, that was the first goal but then because of covid you know just having an object people multiple people touch like became too um too dangerous oh, to so so that's why they ended up inside um oh, but I then actually yeah but then the um the lamps actually were always going to be inside but as i was installing them they were like reflecting into the mm -hmm. trees like if you stood inside they would kind of look like they were reflecting outside and Don and I, who I was working with at the Wildfire Center installing it, we were like, we should have put them, we should have put them outside. <laughs> like, yeah. It would have, it would have, you know, just like hanging in the garden would have, um, would have been great too, but they, um, they weren't weatherproofed, so. Yeah, possible. yeah. But yeah, no, it's, I mean, I, I think this space kind of ended up working because it was a place where the show could exist while we waited to see what would happen with the world, if you know, people could ever come back to the Wildflower Center and, and see them. So um, yeah, they're in this like glass box now. <laughs> they're beautiful. It looks beautiful in there. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I'm what, glad what you got you, to see it. What are you doing now? Is that fair to jump to that subject? <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm in Los Angeles. I'm um, you know I'm in my studio now, um, which is you know back 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 to it, um, and I'm I'm doing like some production for for other artists too, um, which is what I kind of used to do. So that's fun. Does that, that mean you're making things, or does that mean you're doing film-like things? Uh, it means I like call fabricators and like oh, oh. order things for oh, other people. Oh. Yeah. I see. Okay. Like a <laughs> producer. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah.
Any any other questions? I don't know if it's okay to ask a follow up question, but it's Andre, okay, and I'd like to, yeah. if I may. <laughs> I was just just listening to what you were saying about um, all the ways that the pandemic and the shutdown really modified all of the plans that you had. I'm wondering if by some magical way you could have known at the beginning of this journey that that was going to happen, what would you have done differently? Oh, wow. That is quite a question, Andre. Um, I think I would have actually made it just so it could have been outside, like made the lamps with the right wiring so they could have been outdoors. Um, I think I would have done a similar thing, but um, but just made it so it was actually interactable because the garden did end up just kind of opening for outdoor use only and it still is. So um, just made it so people could actually like read the lamps and walk around them. Because really like a lot of the theme in the work I feel are things that people are thinking about and talking about more because of this like pause we all have on you know our normal lives. So um, so yeah, I think it would have fit in the same way, but um, people could have interacted with it more if it was outside. That makes sense. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I think we can do one more question if anybody has it. I see Avery here. I'm going to call her out because I'm sure she has a question. Hello. <laughs> um, okay, let me think of a question, Meredith. I didn't know you were going to call it upon me. You don't have to. But I I... <laughs> um, well, something that you and I personally, for anyone who doesn't know, Meredith was my professor for a semester in sculpture. Um, so I can attest that. She was incredibly helpful and she um, always took the time to like guide her students and to give them the fullest extent of her attention. Um, but something that we personally had a lot of conversations about was this idea of mixing like dysfunction and domesticity and how those work together. So I guess I'm wondering, um, where did where did it go when you were thinking about these things and like where do you find that those fit most i mean i know you're like cut living room piece but um where where did those thoughts go as you were making some of these things i think especially with the lamps do, do you find that that comes through more in the text or materials were also a consideration take it where you want yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, you know, like the one stool ended up becoming like, I mean, yeah, it's funny because in when I started making these, the lamps and the benches, I was like, okay, they're so functional. So like, what, what about them kind of makes them an art practice or like, what's the difference? Um, and then I realized that's like not an important question to ask and just went with it and glad I did. And the so yeah, I made one of the benches actually totally dysfunctional because um, it was kind of to talk about this shift that happened where people could not sit next to each other anymore um, and kind of highlight that. And, um, but otherwise like that kind of dysfunctionality became just more of the content uh, on the text. Um, so a lot of the text cuts like contradictory or kind of offering all these different, you know, kind of like t thought tangents. Um, so yeah, with this, I was kind of thinking about that, but then also how they're connected, like they're all connected with like a rivet gun. Um, and so some of them are kind of loose and like falling on each other. So there, yeah, there definitely is still a bit of that idea of dysfunctionality in the work, but these are probably the most functional things I've, I've ever made. <laughs> The exhibition looks wonderful. You're only missing one half of a leather mattress. 
<laughs> that is that would be my only addition but thank you so much for your talk and for all of your comments yeah thanks for coming all right yeah i guess that's it uh thank you so much Merida. thank you for um yeah. first of all being an awesome fellow but also for uh your flexibility in in such a odd time and uh and this yeah. topic very really great and uh, i think your show came out great so thank you and uh i'm going to applaud i i, I hope everybody else is too but <laughs> <laughs> unmute so we can applaud yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> All right. Well, All right. Thank you, thank everyone, you. for coming.